Hey, welcome everyone to our Word for Word reading series event featuring the winners of the Penman Review Fall Fiction Contest. This year's contest had over 600 blind submissions, of which five winners were selected, and we're excited to have them here tonight to read their pieces and to celebrate SNHU's literary magazine, The Penman Review, which is now in its 11th year. My name is Paul Whitcover, and I'm the Associate Dean of the Online MFA. I'm here with Jacob Powers, my colleague, Associate Dean of the BA and MA Creative Writing Programs. Before we get started, I have some housekeeping items to share. Uh, as I mentioned, the session is being recorded, and you can avoid being recorded by keeping your microphone on mute and not typing in the chat. By participating in the meeting, unmuting your microphone, or participating in the chat, you are consenting to being recorded. Uh, please use the chat window to ask questions. We encourage you to submit questions to be addressed during the general Q&A session. However, due to time constraints, we may not get to every question. Uh, so absolutely feel free to fill up that chat with questions. Jacob and I will be monitoring them and we will make sure that the questions get to our, um, to our uh, readers tonight. Uh, and I guess I'm going to very, very quickly introduce all of our readers. Uh, and then we'll move on to the actual readings. I'll turn it over to my to my colleague Jacob. So uh, our winners are uh, Tim Brumbaugh, uh, Douglas Goff, Kevin Broccoli, uh, H. Derek Persley, and uh, we also have a winner who unfortunately could not be with us tonight, Michael Cabrera. Uh, Jacob will be winning, uh, excuse me, reading his winning entry as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jacob. Thank you so much, Paul, and uh, welcome everyone. It's always great to celebrate the Penman Review's Fall Fiction Contest. Um, I'd like to introduce our first reader for the night, and that is Kevin Broccoli. Uh, Kevin used to find short stories daunting, but during the 2020 pandemic, he wrote a new story every week, even if it wasn't a piece he found worthwhile. Uh, Broccoli is still learning much about himself as an author, but placing fifth in this year's competition has boosted his confidence. Currently, he works in the tech industry, but always makes sure to nurture his creative side and hopes to publish a collection of his stories one day. So Kevin will be reading his piece, Cage the Storm. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, so this is Cage the Storm. I liked it better when we were on the bookcase. The titles were all lined up in front of us and we could read them aloud to each other every night. We'd come up with stories and attach them to the titles. The stories would produce other stories with new titles. It became difficult to tell which story sprung from the child of which imagination and how it connected to one of the spines on the shelf. Remember when we lived in that tchotchke shop in the Bahamas? We were just one bottle amongst so many other bottles. The ships were all painted different colors and the captains had different names, but we never felt special, did we? I remember feeling bad because I wanted to be part of something special, but we were always on sale the same way all the other bottles were on sale. Even when the price is lowered, we would just sit there while the tourists snatch t-shirts with seagulls on them and clamshell necklaces and the worst, the worst snow globes. What could a snow globe offer that we couldn't, aside from snow? We were offering something better adventure on the high seas and daring deeds of the ocean all contained within a beautiful glass bottle. What is a snow globe compared to that? Shake a sphere and watch as snow comes down over a miniature beach, even though snow doesn't do that. It doesn't snow at the beach. That's why people like the beach. The snow globe is a lie. It lies and it lies and it lies. But people, people gravitate towards the lies, especially when they're on vacation especially when their kids are told they can buy one item from the hotel and casino gift shop and they get yelled at when they try and pick up the ship in the bottle because it might break. A snow globe can break too, but it's meant to be jostled. It's meant to be disrupted. It's designed to engage with whoever decides to purchase it. We ask for a little bit more, don't we? We ask that you let us tell you a story. When the store went out of business and the casino was turned into an Amazon distribution center, we found ourselves on a fold-out table with a sign in front of our bottle that read, just take one, please. Even then, we were the last one taken. They say good things come to those who wait, but the bottle that was taken right before us also waited quite a while to be taken, and that one was smashed against a brick wall by a very angry young teenager who was, you know, going through some stuff at the time. 
We were chosen, I like to think of it as being chosen, by a lovely older woman who definitely did not murder her husband. She selected us, brought us home, cleaned us thoroughly, and then placed us on a bookshelf. She had always wanted to decorate her home with nautical items, but her dead husband hated that idea. Right up until his disappearance, he forbade her from ever bringing anything into their home that resembled a ship or a pirate or a parrot or a peg leg or a piece of a map leading to buried treasure. Luckily for us, he was already long gone by the time the older woman walked by the rickety table that we were placed on so that we could instead be placed on a very stable bookshelf in front of titles like What to Do If You Want to Kill Your Husband and Go Ahead and Kill Your Husband and Famous Husband Killers Who All Got Away With It and You Can Too. We had so much fun trying to decipher where those cryptic titles could lead. We'd all gather on the ship and spin yarns as the light from the bay window dwindled to a string. Then we'd stand on the deck as the cage storm raged all around us, the lighting a swirl of bright yellow paint strewn against the glass, the dark clouds delicately dabbled from the bottom of the cork to the base where the dust gathers. Our captain would say that one day we'd be placed in water, maybe not an ocean, but a lake. Maybe not a lake, but a bathtub. Maybe not a bathtub, but a kitchen sink. We'd get to see what floating felt like, that particular bob and dip, the way the water cools the bottom of the bottle. The captain said she lived on a ship like that once, but she won't give us details. She tells us the memories typhoon her heart. She'd rather hold the wheel and steer us over and over again into the storm. After the bookshelf, we were brought into the living room and placed where the husband's urn used to be. We don't know where the urn went, but the cabin boy swears he saw it poking out of the wastebasket. The light in the living room is much better than the light in the library where it wanes so quickly. In the living room, it fills up every carpet fiber and wall fixture. It lasts as though it's invested in what it's done to the room. For the room. We no longer feel as though we're weathering a whirlwind night after night. Instead, we feel as though we're locked in a tempest with the sun all around us. That living room light cradles our bottle in its arms. It assures us that we will break past the glass and the cork and the remnants of the sail sticker that couldn't be scraped off. It tells us that we deserve to be bathed in the light living room light, that we won't need titles given to us by others because we will create our stories out on the open sea. Once we have lived our stories, then and only then will we name them. Thank you. That was wonderful. Uh... What a great story. I mean, I love this story when I read it and hearing you read it really even brought it to life uh, in a in a even more enjoyable way. I mean, the the touches of humor that are scattered all the way through it were just just so great. I was chuckling. Good thing I had my mic off because I was literally chuckling all the way through. Uh, and yet it's also very poignant. So um, just briefly tell us how, how you got the idea for this incredible story. Uh, so because I, I made it a point to try to write a story at least once a week, uh, to, uh, to learn more about the form, um, I look up, you know, prompts on different websites and things. And, uh, one of the prompts was, uh, setting a story on a pirate ship. And I thought, well, I don't really know much about pirates. Um, but I, uh, I, when I was younger, my grandmother got me from Atlantic city, uh, one, a ship in a bottle that I still have. Um, and I, it was at my on my desk and I thought, oh, well, that kind of counts as a pirate ship. Um, and I thought, well, that's nice. I don't have to look up anything about pirates because they're not real pirates. <laughs> so um, uh, that was kind of how that was born. Yeah. Laziness can be it can be an incredible <laughs> stimulant to imagination. And uh, I, I'm, I'm almost afraid to ask about your grandfather, given the subject <laughs> matter of the, <laughs> the story. <laughs> but uh, all right, but thank you so much. And we'll we'll have you back uh, after the rest of the readings in order to uh, answer general Q and A's from our uh, audience. Great, thank you, looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, and our next reader is H. Derek Bursley, and he will be reading his piece, Full Circle. Pursley has a dream of becoming a full-time novelist one day. He currently works as a FedEx delivery driver, but he's a storyteller once night comes, kind of like a vampire. Pursley is a Tennessean father of four and husband to one. With a background in marketing and sports writing, he's pursuing a creative writing degree with SNHU to go after his dream. Welcome, H. Derek Pursley. 
Take it away. All right. Thank you. Okay. So this is called Full Circle. Um, he checked his watch again. Then he thought of how he must look, sitting alone at a table for two, dressed and groomed li- nicely enough. He had tried very hard not to look like he was trying too hard. Checking his watch, then checking the entrance every few moments. He suddenly felt embarrassed. He pulled his phone from the inside breast pocket of his jacket, a gesture that always made him feel slightly more sophisticated than the usual motion of retrieving it from the back pocket of his jeans, and pretended to check something very important, something that was definitely not rearranging the apps on his home screen. Once the very important task had been completed, he replaced his phone, made a conscious effort not to check his watch or the door, and watched the candlelight reflecting off of two glasses, one full with a clear purpose to serve and the other empty, seemingly anxious and hopeful. In the well-lit parking lot of one of the few fine dining restaurants in town, in the driver's seat of a small Toyota SUV, she hurriedly, hurriedly applied her mascara and checked her work in the visor mirror. It was not necessarily a matter of time, for once she actually had a fair amount of time to get ready after her mother had picked up her son earlier that evening, but she had become such an expert at applying makeup piecemeal in car mirrors that the opportunity to do so in her full-length mirror at home felt foreign and uncomfortable. He must be something special, her mother had said when she saw three dresses and five pairs of shoes shoes laid out on the bed. I don't know, she had replied. I'm honestly just excited to do a grown-up activity and eat a meal without ketchup. Her mother had raised an eyebrow in silent, skeptical response. Of course, she did hope that he was something special, that this would be something special. But she knew better, better than to get her hopes up about these things. Plus, there was a reason it hadn't worked out between them the first time around. In fact, there were several reasons. And although they had both lived, grown, and experienced quite a lot in the years since, she was not sure they had changed that much. Damn it, he mentally chided himself for reflexively checking his watch again. It was only 8.07. She was only seven minutes late, but he had been sitting there for 17 of the longest minutes he could remember. He fidgeted with the buttons on his jacket, covertly examining the entrees of other diners, ran his fingers across the flame of the candle, avoided eye contact with the restaurant staff. It would have been easier to wait with a drink. This was another one of the small, countless challenges of sobriety that normal people would never understand. Of course, if he had a drink, it would quickly turn into three, then six, and everything he had worked for over the last four years would go down the drain. This is the constant, lethal danger of living with alcoholism. That every restaurant, gas station, grocery store, drugstore, venue, and essentially anywhere anywhere else commerce exists sells poison for him. It was as if he had a deadly peanut allergy, if peanuts were a foundational element of socializing that made everyone else happy and carefree. As if mentally drawn, the server appeared, temptation and pity personified, and asked, would you like a drink while you wait? It was not his drinking that made her end things between them 11 years ago. Had it really been that long? But it had made for an easy excuse. He was an obvious, undeniable alcoholic, but he was never violent and rarely mean. They were never officially a couple anyway. She knew that he wanted to be, but she was 22 and unready to commit to anyone, especially someone as flaky and damaged as he had been. Of course, one of life's countless little ironies came only 10 months later in the form of a cute guitarist, a missed period, and a little plus sign on a pea stick. She would always feel conflicted about this as it irrevocably changed the course of her life, but also gave her the most perfect little human to ever walk the earth. She quickly became an adult and put all the partying and a fair fair number of possibilities in the rearview mirror. She knew that she had still accomplished quite a lot for a single mother, community college, a fulfilling career, home ownership, but it was hard not to think of what could have been. Although breaking things off with him had not been in her top five regrets, she certainly thought about him from time to time, and it might have been in the top ten. She wasn't coming. He knew it now. If she hadn't loved him all those years ago, why would she even be interested now? His belly had flattened, then rounded. The pepper of his hair seemed to have more salt every week. He had been through more treatment centers, courtrooms, therapists, and AA meetings than 10 normal people would ever see. Yet he knew it was not all bad. He might not necessarily consider himself to be a success, but he was certainly no longer a failure. He had finally put some potential to good use and established a relatively successful career. He had a decent amount of money and even a few stocks in ETFs, and most importantly, he had not taken a drink or a drug in years. He was the closest he had ever been to happy with himself. If he was ever going to deserve to be with someone as wonderful as she, this was, the time was now. His mind flashed back, as it had at least a thousand times over the years. 
to the first time he saw her standing by a ping pong table with a Pabst blue ribbon in one hand and a red paddle in the other, all but glowing the way he thought a goddess would. Judging by her social media photos, she still looked mostly the same, but maybe when she walked now, her feet tread on the ground. Her makeup was as good as it was going to get. Her hair was meticulously styled to look as though she had put no effort into it. She had changed from her sandals back into her heels. There were no emergency calls or texts from her mother. There was absolutely no reason for her to still be in the car, yet here she was. She checked her phone again, 8, 11 p.m., and no new notifications. She was not intentionally making him wait, but she would rather him she would rather he think that than think that she was nearly crippled by anxiety over the first date she had been on in over a year. Maybe this was a mistake. She she started the car and began formulating a reasonable, not technically lying excuse. Then she said aloud, "Fuck it." Maybe he should call her. She was almost 15 minutes late now, and in his experience, that was generally the longest a person should be expected to wait without calling or leaving. But he knew she had a son and so many more serious adult responsibilities than he had, and maybe it was understandable. He did not want to seem overzealous in reaching out to to her. He feared that he had already come on too strongly by asking her to dinner before he had even fully moved back into town. Maybe that is what happened. Maybe she had only agreed to meet up with him as friends and then changed her mind once he suggested the overtly romantic restaurant. Or maybe she's had an emergency with her son and could not be bothered by such a tedious chore of canceling their date which was relatively meaningless by comparison. Or maybe he had just told her the wrong time. If that were the case, he would look silly for waiting there so long without calling. Once again, he retrieved his phone from his jacket pocket, this time with no feeling of satisfaction or sophistication, and scrolled through the contacts to her name. After realizing he had been holding his breath, he said aloud, fuck it. He pressed send and held the phone to his ear. Then, simultaneous to hearing the traditional ringing traditional ringing sound in his phone, he heard an old song, a song that he remembered loving approximately 11 years ago in the tinny condensed audio of a ringtone. He looked over and saw her, as stunning as ever, standing just inside the softly lit foyer and pulling a phone from her handbag. A tiny smile flashed across her face as as he inferred she had read the caller ID and she looked around the dining room. Their eyes met. The end. Thank you so much, uh, H. Derek Persley. That was wonderful. Um, I really encourage everyone uh, to to check out uh, this piece on the Penman Review as well. I think what what really impressed me with it as I was reading um, is how you were able to switch point of views um, so flawlessly between each paragraph. So it would go from you know you, you're seeing one side of the coin of the relationship, and then you go to the other side of the coin of the relationship, and you know, as the narrative progresses, you begin to uh, uh, formulate into one scene and and end on that one scene. Um, really hard to do that, especially in such um, you know a short story in a short amount of time. You have you have these limitations with word choices. How did you approach that? I mean, how did you make sure to keep you know the point of views and and narrative uh, intact to to not cross you know lines or anything like that? What, what strategies did you end up using? So I I think having them in separate locations for most of the story made it, you know, you can change between the settings and that made it a little easier. But I actually wrote this for um, a creative writing class that I was taking. um, And it was either the professor, it may have been one of my peers who recommended that maybe I put some some sort of like dividing thing in between to make it more clear, because I guess there were points in which maybe it wasn't clear at first. Um, and that's where I found, I know people listening can't see it, but um, there are these little characters in between that signify, you know, when, uh, when there's a, a break. Um, so, yeah, that was actually some good feedback I got from someone and, uh, and really helpful. Awesome. Yeah, it, it was wonderful. Uh, really cool. Uh, and, and just, again, creates a cool uh, approach to the narrative as well. Because, I mean, like, as, the, as, as it progresses you know, the relationship starts to unfold and you're like, oh, okay, they worked together at one point before and you didn't know that. And then it's like, okay, he has alcoholism, but she doesn't blame him for the alcoholism. And it's just really cool how in each scene, it it kind of uh, reveals a little bit more about this relationship that that we're just kind of learning ourselves as it goes along. So um, thank you again so much for for reading uh, for us tonight. Uh, Wonderful work. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. 
And unfortunately, as, as as Paul said at the beginning of uh, the night, our third reader, Michael Michael Cabrera, could not make it tonight. Um, but we did receive permission to read uh, his piece for him. So I, I will do that. But before I do so, I will share his bio. Having always loved to tell stories and make up scenarios in his head, Michael Cabrera has been writing since he was a kid. This year's fall fiction contest is the first time he has entered a writing contest, and he is honored to have placed third. A few years ago, Cabrera wrote and published his first novel and knew it was the path for him. Currently, he is a graphic designer earning his bachelor's degree in creative writing and English from SNHU, and this scholarship will help him succeed in his degree. So I will be reading Michael's winning story, Michael Rowe, but before doing so, just again, congratulations, Michael, uh, to this when you eventually see this uh, uh, recording and uh, best wishes as well. All right. So this is Michael Rowe by Michael Cabrera. Even in the fall, it always felt like summer at my grandma's house. Maybe it was just the weather of California, but it felt like her corner of the neighborhood radiated sunlight and warmth. From the shimmering of the concrete that led to the basketball hoop in the backyard to the white painted playhouse on wooden beams that my grandpa built ages ago, the sun was everywhere. Sometimes it was too much. It hurt my eyes. I hid indoors, not one to play house or even basketball, until my grandma insisted I play at the shady park across the street. At this park, there was a particular tree. It's still there, actually. I loved climbing it. It was considered the oldest tree in the city, and I climbed it until I was 12 or 13, when it became awkward to climb trees. I loved touching it and picking its long, rattling pods in the ground beneath its twisted branches. Its trunk felt cold and hard, and yet I could feel life and age beneath the bark. I played there, sometimes with my brothers, sometimes a cousin or two, sometimes alone, until some dove from somewhere cooed lazily, the shade stretched well beyond the park, and the street lights flickered, stale citrus colors. My grandma always had herbal tea ready when I returned. She served it from a small white pot. The cups were pretty ceramic things. She asked me how my day was, her tone proper and regulated. I let my legs dangle from my seat, kicking to the rhythm of the Mexican music playing from a radio in the background. I'd answer her questions, reflecting her tone as best I could. I knew she wanted to, uh, me to. She wanted me to speak like an adult. Sometimes she brought a photo album out, and we look at pictures of my father when he was a boy. He looked exactly like me at my age. I wondered how many times he sat in the very seat I was sitting in drinking tea, how many times he may have gone to the park. I was encouraged to play the piano when I was at grandma's house while she made dinner. Music books and cardboard key guides were stored in the creaking black bench. The seat lifted up and the books were so old that I could smell them. I picked one up. Its corners were folded and swollen, but the cover was bright and colorful. What started as a few formless melodies and chromatic scales evolved to jingle bells and Mary had a little lamb from the book. Then I found a song with my name in it. It was about rowing a boat. I liked boats. I liked my name. It was my father's name. I played it once or twice, reading the words to the song. It seemed religious, just like the room I was in with the painting of Christ blessing the wall and the winged angels on the shelf spaces. Loved ones watched me from picture frames. I played it a third time, trying by memory and mouthing the words, making some up if I couldn't remember. The bench shifted, and she was beside me. Her mouth smiled, but her eyes were tight with pain. She still wore her blue cooking apron with the small white flowers and with a border that flared out like petals. Do you know this song, Abuelita? I asked her. Yes, your daddy used to play it. He was very good with the piano. Keep playing. I played it from memory. Small fingers tapped the black and white keys. And when I was done, I played it again, trying desperately hard not to miss notes. She sang the song for me, and it sounded dreary and echoed in darkening room. Michael row the boat ashore, hallelujah. She closed her eyes. She knew all the verses. I could hear them muffled beneath her tears. 
I didn't know what to do, so I played it again. Letting her have her memory. Letting her have her Michael. It was all I could offer. Her sadness was penetrating, and I could feel it pulsing from her soul and filling the air. What was left of the words to the song turned to soft sobs from her lips. And then she placed a hand over my fingers to keep me from pressing more keys. And that was Michael Rowe by Michael Cabrera. And we thank him uh, for uh, letting us share that with all of you tonight. And again, wish him the best. Um, just just uh, a beautiful piece, huh, Paul? <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree. It, it's like uh, I, I wrote in the chat. I was just wowed by the um, the 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 precisely ch chosen details, all of which just rang so true and were so beautifully uh, consonant with the theme of the of the story and just that that overall tone and that last gesture of the grandmothers was just so poignant and and powerful. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you again, Michael, and. Um... We're going to go ahead and, and, and kick it over to uh, uh, Tim now. I think, Paul, you'll introduce him, so I'll hop yeah. back off for now. Okay, thanks, Jacob. Great reading, by the way. Um, so our fourth story of the night, Snowfall, was written, written by Tim Brumbaugh. Uh, Tim Brumbaugh has been writing for the last 15 years and often must ignore the little gremlin on his shoulder telling him he can't do it. So winning second place feels amazing for him. Rumbaugh is currently achieving his MFA in speculative fiction from SNHU while teaching high school English and says this scholarship couldn't come at a better time for him. And as the, uh, the dean of the MFA program, let me just say I'm very proud and pleased to see uh, uh, one of our students uh, achieving this honor for such a great story. And with that, Tim, I'm just going to turn it over to you. OK, thanks. Um, OK, this is Snowfall. Most people don't believe me when I tell them that you can hear the snow fall. It's true. It's not one of those auditory hallucinations when your mind convinces you that it heard something that isn't really there. And it's not something only I can hear. I'm not special. Anyone can hear it. The thing is, you can't hear it in the city. There's too much background noise. Snowfall is soft, a whisper. Go far out into the country. Turn your car off, wait and listen. When your ears stop ringing and roaring from the lingering sounds of people and cars and radios, then you'll hear it. It's the sound of a thousand leaves falling breathlessly to the ground, like the murmur of soft feet pattering across stone. The first time I remember hearing the snowfall was the winter you died. I had only been working at the La Paloma Cantina for a few months, and you were the only waitress who didn't think she was too good to talk to me. I was sort of between jobs, between cities, really. I wanted to start my life all over again somewhere new. I told you all of this once, but you had so many people in your life coming and going, I don't know if you'd remember. I told you I was dying to get out of Kansas, but I discovered I just couldn't leave. I couldn't even leave Wichita, let alone the whole state. This city holds on to you. It's like a singularity that pulls in anyone who ventures too close. Like an unholy god, it's a void of palpable wickedness. You know that better than anyone, I guess. I've been smoking a lot of crack lately, you said one night. It was late December, my birthday. No one knew. We sat out back by the dumpsters. Our cigarette smoke masked the stench of grease and decay. I stared down at my shoes and your eyes studied me, bored straight into my mind. I didn't say anything. What can you say to a confession like that? I wanted to leave. I wanted to be anywhere but next to you in that tangible silence between us. I knew you had a drug problem. All the staff knew about it, but then again, all the staff also had a drug problem. Vicodin, mostly. You would brag that you could down 17 tens in a single shift, an obscene number of opioids. Your eyes continued their tunneling. You waited for my response, but I still said nothing. I just sat there with my heart sunk into my cold, wet shoes. You took another drag. Good talk, you said. You threw your marber on the ground. I watched you leave, your brown curls bobbed like loose springs. I sat alone. Dishwater soaked through my clothes and stung my skin. This is how I handle difficult conversations. Disengage, preclude any possibility of eye contact, say nothing. But I should have said something. 
Later that night, after countless drinks and Vicodin, he forgot about our conversation and came back to the kitchen with shots. One for me, one for you. I told you no thanks. I didn't feel like drinking. Two for you then. I told you it was my birthday. What the fuck are you doing here? You threw your head back and your face contorted in an expression of shock and disgust. I shrugged. I told you I had no one to celebrate with and turning 30 and still being a dishwasher was nothing to celebrate anyways. You told me at 25 you weren't doing much better. You left and came back with four shots. This time it was two for me and two for you. I didn't turn them down. You offered me a handful of Vicodin. What the hell, it's my birthday. I took one and told you that was enough. You laughed at me and downed four pills with a shot of Southern comfort. You asked me why I was still in Wichita. You're too nice for a place like this. Sooner or later, you're gonna end up like the rest of us. These bitches around here are always stabbing each other in the back, and for what? It sounded like a rhetorical question, so I didn't answer. You were right about the women waiting tables. They hate each other, but they all pretend to be friends. What you didn't realize is the men in the kitchen were just as bad. I took a shot, Bacardi 151. I'm actually moving to Vegas, I said. I have some friends down there. I'm just kind of stuck here, temporarily. Uh-huh. You leaned over and strummed your fingernails on the stainless steel counter. And how long has it been since you decided you were going to move away to Vegas? You asked after a breath. I had to think about that. Three years? It came out as a question, but it was the truth. And you're still here? I guess. What's keeping you? I don't know. Every time I save up enough money for the trip, something happens. Car broke down once. Another time my money got stolen. That's why you use a bank, dummy. You slapped my chest and laughed. I don't trust banks. Been fucked over by them before. Bounce a check and they hit you with a ton of fees. You already were in the negative, otherwise a check wouldn't have bounced. Now you're in it even deeper. Anyways, something always happens to keep me here. I shrugged. I had crossed Wichita's event horizon. There was no escape now. You bounced up, put your arms around me, and kissed me. We stumbled in the embrace, our feet slipping on the grease-covered floor. But when we connected, I found your mouth soft, your lips delicate like overripe fruit. Your tongue was light and honeyed, aggressive. For just a moment, I couldn't smell the oil, the dishwater, or the counterfeit Mexican food. Only the scent of your breath and that apricot tang of southern comfort. You pulled away slow, your smile wide. I wish I knew what you wanted me to do at that moment. Anything? Instead, I stood there, immobile, like the sculptures of the Virgin Mary holding the dead Christ, eyes downcast, face expressionless. Breathe, you said. I closed my eyes and exhaled all at once. I shuddered. Got to get back to it. You slapped me on the chest again. Happy birthday, you sang over your shoulder. Then you walked out. A week later, you were dead. When I came to work, the news of your death was on everyone's lips. Did you know that Heather died of a crack overdose? The wait staff gossiped about your excesses. Every man in the kitchen said you had tried to sleep with him. They all laughed, crackheads. They rolled their eyes and shrugged. The loudest were the ones that smoked crack with you. Dustin, the busboy, and Marcus, the line cook, would both sit in your car in the parking lot to hit the pipe with you. Now they laughed at your overdose. Your mother called that very morning to ask if she could have your final paycheck. Wichita really is the city that eats its own. After work, I drove out to Cheney Park. It was snowing. It came down quick and in large, formless clumps, and before long, the snow was a shroud that buried the city, as if the earth itself tried to hide its shame and guilt. I turned off my car and laid on the hood. I listened to the ticking of the engine cooling. I heard the dying rush of a restless world. Then, when the world was finally silent, I heard the snowfall. It was like 10,000 galloping horses heard across an ocean. Thank you so much for reading that uh, for us tonight, Tim. Um, this, this is definitely, a, it's, it's a story that deals with tough issues, right? There's drug yes. addiction, there's loneliness, there's this, this idea of like the yearning to leave the mundane, or uh, Wichita <laughs> in, in, in this case, a feeling of hopelessness as well. Um, and I think what what stuck out to me, especially in it, is how it's book ended by these two paragraphs about the snowfall and everything and how the, the style of those paragraphs sets up a, a pacing to the piece that that almost creates a calm meditative silence. 
right? Like when you're saying anyone can hear it. The thing is, you can't hear it in the city. There's too much background noise. Snow is a soft. Snow is soft. Well, it's a whisper. You know, turn your car off. Wait and listen. Those those brief small pauses help us almost get into a moment of like, all right, we're about to deal with some. And pardon my French, serious shit here, right? Yeah. We're gonna get into some pretty hard stuff. And I really appreciated how you how you did that. What made you do it that way? I mean, you know, this these these are tough issues. What made you approach it in that kind of calming, meditative manner? Um, well, the uh, without the the snowfall part, um, I had written that story like ten years ago, and uh, it was not very good when I wrote it. It was like five thousand words long. It was too much. Um, I submitted it to a couple of places. It got rejected. I I kind of shelved it for for. I think like six years I put it on the shelf and didn't even look at it um, and then it just it snowed one night here in North Texas which it doesn't do very often and uh, I went outside it was like one o'clock in the morning and I could hear the snowfall because I live in a really quiet uh, really quiet neighborhood and I could hear it fall and I, I came back inside and I wrote the very first paragraph and I thought I have to turn this into a story somehow or a poem or something um, and then I just got the thought of that story that I had abandoned. And I thought I need to I need to go back to it because now, you know, I've been going to um, I've been going to school here at SNHU and, and I've, I've been you know, my, up in my you know, writer's game. And uh, so I, I just stripped it of everything non-essential and just thought I should I should add something at the end too to kind of bookend it with the snowfall. And uh, yeah, that's that's the, the kind of the genesis of that story. That well, that is really cool, and and um, to be frank, quite inspirational too. I think for a lot of our our guests and stuff, where it's like, hey, you can re-explore earlier stuff and earlier works, and you know, you know, add add new meaning to it by just simply adding these these lines. And I think that that those snowfall lines do especially uh, uh, help create a, a specific tone for the rest of the piece that carries over really well. And uh, being in New England myself, where we haven't had much snowfall this year and stuff, but like being in an area where there's not a lot of people and stuff I, it, it it is quite meditative and, and stuff to hear it um uh and yeah like and, i said it doesn't snow much here in north texas but i'm right from maine. i'm from maine so i you, you know, are okay i missed Great. the snow so when it snowed i was outside at one o'clock in the morning just you know listening to it and yeah feeling it. so yeah i was moved i guess Bring bring back some memories of Maine and stuff of course well thank you so much uh for reading it was it was wonderful and 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 for um um, coming tonight and uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll we'll have you back in a few minutes to uh, answer a couple of questions from folks and stuff. But in the meantime, um, I want to get to our our last reader for the night. We've had a wonderful night of readings, uh, and we'd like to finish with Douglas uh, W. Goff, who will be reading from his story "Run Chicken Run." Um, Douglas W. Goff has always been told he should be a writer, but only recently began taking his writing seriously. Um, and this year he entered the 2022 Fall Fiction Contest to showcase his work and hopefully win a scholarship to finish his degree at SNU, which he did. So congratulations, Douglas. Um, Goff is honored and feels validated in his creative work to have placed first. Um, he spent his life serving others as a U.S. Marine. Um, thank you for your service. And he's a retired federal agent and the creator of a family-run homeless program called Fifth Wheel. Um, however, his writing is the first thing he does solely for himself out of uh, pure love for it. So welcome, uh, Douglas. We're so happy to have you read. Um, and if you'd like, uh, feel free to hop onto the camera so we can see you. And um, we'll go from there. Awesome. I'll start with a shameless plug for the university with my mug that I won. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> All right, it's hard to go after something that dark, but it was good. Here we go. I feel the need to explain the concept of chicken catching as it has become all too obvious that most people are not well versed in the methods of capturing our fine feathered friends. Many people think that just because they are bird brains, they can't hatch a means of escape. Nay, I say, most chickens are masters in the art of escape. The first step in catching a chicken is of course to determine that one has escaped. There are two widely accepted methods. This can be accomplished by conducting a head count or a roll call. The roll call can be difficult because the common rank and file chicken appears to have no respect for authority and they often cluck out of order. I personally use the headcount method because I only have two hens. If at any point the, in the count I do not reach the number two, then I can assume that an unauthorized absence 
is afoot and the hunt begins. This brings us to the second step in chicken catching, which is location. A quick search of the yard usually yields positive results as chickens do tend to cluck, thus making their attempts at cover and concealment fairly ineffective. The discovery of the chicken escapee leads us to the next step, which is organization. Make no mistake, the third organizational step is the most technical part to a successful capture of a deviant chicken. I suggest a three person front. I utilize my wife and daughter to complete my offensive unit. This is personal preference, but I place my wife to my left and my daughter to my right and we advance. The fourth step is the maneuvering phase. You want to advance forward in an arc line, pushing the runaway foul committing foul into a corner. The trick here is to keep moving forward, keeping the chicken on the defense. A chicken on the offense can break your ranks. Should the outlaw clucker initiate an offensive move and advance against your line, it could halt your forward progress. In my semi not so professional observations, I've noticed that if the offending chicken rushes a smaller child, said child will usually break and run, leaving your flank exposed. You must be prepared to shift left or right should this occur. That is why you should always place the person with the least amount of chicken phobia in the center of your line. This pivot man should be stout of heart and firm of hand, able to stare down an angry charging hen without flinching or faltering. The key anchor person must be filled with the fighting spirit of, not today chicken, not on my watch. So once you have pushed the chicken into an enclosed corner, you will find that they have a tendency to stick their heads right into the corner with their behinds pointing towards you. This is of course the infamous, if I don't see them, then they can't see me tactic. Do not fall for this trick. You can still see the chicken. Now we have reached the fifth and final step, the capture. Approach the chicken, keeping in mind that she can't see you and gently but firmly grasp the body of the bird with one hand on each side of the animal. If she is unable to flap her wings, then you did a most excellent job. Making contact with both hands at the same time will help keep down on the high number of horrible chicken pecking incidents that occur. You can then safely return the bird to her coop. This is the appropriate time to verbally admonish the offending fowl, helping her to understand that she, what she did was wrong. Don't expect the response as they brood. In closing, I will leave you with an easy to access, convenient five-step chart. Chicken catching, step one, detect escape. Step two, locate escapee. Step three, organization. Step four, maneuvering phase. And step five, the capture. That's it. Thanks for that, Douglas. That's hilarious. Um, and, and I can't help but, but wonder, um, is is this drawn from your own personal experience as a as a chicken hunter? Well, we have twenty two chickens now. I absolutely adore animals. They're like my favorite thing on the planet. We have a cat. We just got a doodle dog for my son. He's got some health issues, so we got it for Christmas. Um, I like to write a lot about animals, actually, and I often wonder what they think because they're they're always they're such odd things. I mean, they're always looking like they're thinking something. So, I mean, I know chickens have small brains, but when you're chasing them, <laughs> it's quite difficult. They're very clever. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you so much for uh, for reading it uh, uh, for us, Douglas. And um, yeah, the humor, the humor throughout uh, is clear. And um, you know, you had mentioned in your bio, you know, that you served as a U.S. Marine, you're a uh, retired federal agent, and, you know, you, you could certainly feel that a little bit, I, I, and these directives on how to, you know, how yeah. to corner the chicken and stuff, which is, which is wonderful. And that actually, um, you know, I think that's, that's a good uh, launching point to, uh, you know, our Q&A session and everything. And if all, all, all of our readers would like to hop onto the camera, they're welcome to, or you can stay off until we call you out. But, um, you know, one of the things that I noticed in, in several of, of your bios that I read on the Penman Review website is uh, being mentioned, mentioned that you're being inspired by real life events and situations. And Paul kind of alluded to that um, with yours, Douglas, and, and your family purchasing nearly two dozen chickens to raise. Um, and in and, and Michael's case as well, uh, he, he reflected on the loss of his grandmother. And, and I think that we can all obviously feel that um, in, in, the, in the piece that I had read. Um, uh in addition to that you know uh my tim uh you thought about your experiences with like the snowfall in northern texas and everything so you know when you're writing these pieces and stuff how do you draw the line uh between fictional works and real life inspiration like what what makes where is that line if you will um how about i i i, I 
take it over to Tim first, and then we can circle back to you again, Douglas, to, to hear what you think. Um, yeah, for me, I don't know if I know where that line is. Um, it's, it's definitely not a hard line, for sure. Um, yeah, I think everything, for me, everything is kind of fair game. Um, my best characters and, and my best stories are, you know, pulled from real life. I just, I just find them more, um, you know, enticing than anything I can just make up. So the line's a little bit blurred. As long as, as I, I, you know, remove myself completely from uh, the narrative or the narrator, um, then I, I feel like, you know, I can, I can do it, I can do it justice. And what about you, Douglas? Do you do you carry a similar weight uh, to to what Tim does, or how how do you approach the the line between fiction like and nonfiction? Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a fine line. I uh, I probably got about two hundred pieces online right now, and the responses are always way stronger for the nonfiction or something that's got a hint of truth in it. And I think mm -hmm. that's probably because it involves emotions. And I've noticed. I mean, I do have pieces that are completely fiction, but I noticed the responses are just a lot stronger when they're, you've got involvement in the piece. Right. I think, I mean, probably there, there's a, a part of it where, you know, when you're, when you're adding your personal reflection to it, you know, it's, it's easier perhaps for readers to connect to that because they can feel that, that presence that you're reflecting on um, in both of your pieces and stuff. And I think that's why, uh, it works equally well to 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 have a laugh at, while you're chasing chickens and catching them, of course, and and yet the the seriousness of it as well to make sure that you're 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 uh, putting them in place. But then at the same time, you know Tim's piece where uh, you're dealing with some um, some very heavy issues and stuff. Um, uh, book ended again by just listening to snow falling in northern Texas. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, I, I I will read a question here uh, from the chat, um, and this is to all the readers. So anyone who wants to jump in, uh, uh, please do. Um, have you all written uh, creatively or otherwise your entire lives, or did any of you discover the passion later on? When when did you suddenly go, wow, I really like doing this, and 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 how did you come to that? I well, know I it's I'll hard. Okay. If you want me to. There you uh, go. Jump on in. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I kind of, I've been writing my whole life. I, I just, um, you know, I'll write something a long time ago when I first started writing, you know, I'd write something and uh, I wouldn't think it was good enough. So I wouldn't write again for years and years and years. And then I'd write something else um, and then think, okay, I suck. I'm just going to put it away. Um, it wasn't until I read, um, I think, On Writing by Stephen King where I learned that like revision is super important. And these stories that I've been writing, those are just the first, you know, shitty drafts and, and real writing comes from revision. So once I read that book, um, everything changed for me. Excellent craft book. Yes. Um, Kevin, what about you? I mean, it, it, what are you, did, have you always kind of- I think Stephen King is a formative book for many, yeah. I yeah. I also think if you're gonna write a book about writing, you should also put the book list at the end like he did, um, which was a big help. Um, I, I started in theater, and so um, I was an actor from the time I was eight. And then when I was out of college, uh, I couldn't get any roles because they just, uh, it, you had to find monologues to audition with. And I started writing my own monologues because if you go to an audition for theater, you're going to find every kid there does something from those horrible monologue books about, you know, they're just, they're God awful. Um, so I just wrote my own and then that transitioned into uh, playwriting. And then uh, during the pandemic, uh, someone suggested, well, you know, how, why don't you ever write uh, prose or short stories and that kind of thing? And I thought, no, plays are so much easier. You just write what people say. You know, like I never, I, I said to a friend, I never, I don't care what the girl's dress looks like. I don't <laughs> care. In theater, you don't have to worry because there's gonna be a costume designer. There's gonna be a set designer. You don't have to worry about what the trees look like or the sunlight coming through the window. You just put words in people's mouths. And I thought, yep, that I can do that. Um, and then I started subscribing to George Saunders free 
you can get a paid membership and you can get a bit more, but for free, you still get tons of, it's like a writing class for him. And okay. I was so inspired by that, that I started um, working on short stories. And um, so I've gotten a little bit further into that, but it, I still highly recommend playwriting instead. It's just so much easier. <laughs> if you if you find yourself really exhausted by prose, just, just consider whether or not you might want to be a playwright. <laughs> Awesome. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for plugging George Saunders, Saunders as well, of course. Um, excellent writer for those who have not had an opportunity to read his work. Um, and he also has a lot of great advice. I, I've met a few of his, um, um, you know, students and stuff over the years at AWP, and they have nothing to say but just high praise for him being a wonderful instructor and, 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 and guidance to, uh, with writing. Um, uh, Derek, H. Derek Pursley. Um, before we move any further, you, you have a background in, in marketing and sports writing, but you also work as a FedEx driver. And as, as the bio said, you have four children at home, which mm -hmm. I imagine I have two and I, I am sometimes at the brink. <laughs> so I imagine having four is, is, is quite a, a juggle. So where the heck do you find the time to write with such a busy schedule? Um, knowing that a lot of our own, you know, students and stuff also have incredibly busy schedules and stuff. Um, where, where do you find the time? It's it's not easy. Um, I mean, even just finding the time for this, uh, you know, I, I planned ahead. I, I had everything locked down. Okay, this is when we're going to eat dinner. I'm going to pick them up. I had the day off today. And of course, it all went to shit a couple of hours beforehand. <laughs> so, yeah, I, uh, but, but I managed to, uh, they're, they're in bed and hopefully mostly asleep right now. It's just finding little times because you know you can try to plan it out but it's it's rarely going to work I honestly I come up with a lot of my stuff as I'm driving I realize that I that's when I get a lot of my thinking done anyway it just you know life and whatever and so a as I'm driving I will sort of just come up with ideas and I'll I'll make some little notes on my phone if you know if there's something particularly that I want to follow up on or you know, I've got like a little list of just random ideas and then, you know, some things I've, I've delved further into. And then it's usually late at night when everybody's in bed. I can start putting things together. That's awesome. So, yeah, it's it's nice to have a career where you have that time to be able to think uh, a little bit uh, while while you're doing the task at hand as well and everything. So now I'm yeah. starting to question whenever I see, you know, uh, FedEx or UPS drivers, you know, when they're typing down things, I'm like, are they are they typing, you know, plots or are they are they just saying they've dropped off the package? Now I'm going to start wondering. So you never know what's going on. You yeah. never know. But it's and, a great strategy. I I mean, it's it's wonderful to be able to to take that time. And then, you know, um, I think one of the things that stuck out to me was you said you, you you take notes as you're you're going along and then transcribe it later on. So it's not a immediate like all right i gotta write this down but like you know saving the notes for later on is is, is something that i guess I, su I suppose you would recommend to others who might not have that time either oh he may have frozen oh it looks like he did freeze okay well that's okay um but thank you so much uh uh that that's wonderful um, i'm going to kick it over to paul to go ahead and ask a co question from the chat uh, sure. Um, there is a question here um, about uh, recurring motifs in each of your work. Um, is that something that you've, as you've, as you've worked at, on your writing and have worked on different short stories, have you found that there are, are motifs that either in terms of theme or in terms of like your approach to writing, your maybe stylistic? Um, and and if you when you notice those things, what's your response to them? Do you kind of lean into them and try to incorporate them more into your work, or do you kind of like uh, lean away from them because you don't want to say do the same thing over and over again? Go ahead, Doug. Well, those are probably sound weird, but I love to write about vampires, but I missed the bus by about thirty years, I guess, <laughs> or twenty years. Um, It'll circle yeah. back around circle back around. Uh, I just won a contest about a vampire, so that was surprising go. to me. I didn't think that could happen um, in this day and age, but yeah, I mean, I think you notice with other writers too, There's there could either be a dark theme in their writing or 
a light theme or things along that line. I'm not sure quite where I fall yet. I mean, your story had a very powerful voice to it. I mean, one of the great things about about your story was, I mean, there's the, all this stuff going on on the surface, which is quite amusing in and of itself, um, but also the peak that it gives us into the character of the narrator is also right. really, really fascinating. Well, people have referred to me as a 21st century humorist, so I had to look that up when I first got back into writing. <laughs> but uh, a lot of my stuff does have a funny slant to it or a twist, a funny twist at the end. Yep. What about you, Tim or Kevin? That that same question. Um. So I just know that for myself, um, I'm a podcast junkie. I have like a, a just a list of podcasts I listen to every day. It's insane. And after a while, I had to come up with some criteria for like, how do I, which of these do I actually want to listen to and which one are. And so um, a friend of mine recommended the rule about insight or information that that everything, uh, he said, why don't you try saying, am I learning something or am I looking at something in a way I've never looked at it before? And once you do that, you immediately get rid of 90% of NPR. <laughs> um, it just goes right out the window. Because um, it's just people regurgitating stuff that you, it's just, choir preaching a lot. And so now when I write, my criteria for myself is I either need to learn something or by working on the piece, I need to force myself to look at something that I haven't looked at before or try to look at it in a new way. And then hopefully by doing that, that's the experience the reader has as well. Um, you know, I'm I'm also an animal lover too. So it was, I really enjoyed your story a lot. I was like, oh good. And, and I'm like, I'll listen to animal stories all, all day. Um, but one of the, the other, a few weeks ago, I was working on a story and I needed to know, I go, okay, well, I'm, this is a group of, um, it was like a group of snails. And I said, well, what are, what's a group of snails called? And so I had to look that up and now I know what a group of snails is. And so what I say to people <laughs> who comment on my stories is, okay, well, if you hated the story, now, if you're ever on Jeopardy and they, and the clue is something about a group. <laughs> Uh, I would come out at the end of, at the beginning of the show to say, turn off your cell phones. And I would always come out with like a joke or a riddle. And so what I would say to the audience is, even if you hate the show you're about to see, at least you have a joke that you can tell, you know, so that, that was always, that's always my thing. So it's not so much a recurring thing as um, I want them to walk away from it. I can't control if they like it, but I can at least say, okay, well, they definitely didn't know this before or they probably haven't looked at this particular thing in this way before. Yeah, I really like what you said there about um, learning something new from the stories that you're writing. I mean, I think a lot of times, uh, especially beginning writers think that they have to know what they want to say before they set out to write the story. And then the story is simply saying what they wanted to say, whereas I think when you get more experience in writing, it often is the case where writing the story is what teaches you what the story is trying to say. You don't really know beforehand. I mean, is that something that you, that you would all agree with or am I wrong? Tell me I'm wrong. And, that, and then that's kind of a wonderful, to me, that's a very liberating thing because it's like, oh, thank God, because I, I don't know very many things, right? And especially about my own writing. So it's very liberating to feel like, ah, oh, I don't have to know what this is about. I'll just, I'll let the story figure it out. <laughs> it, it seems to be a nice mix uh, or, or blend from what I've seen um, in the stories tonight and from what I've read in recent years too, of, of you know, talking about real life experiences or scenarios that, that one has actually, you know, experienced, but also throwing in that that element of like, learning like what how can how can i implement you know a, a new idea into it and stuff and, and kevin i think you had actually even mentioned that in your in your bio you know the what if scenario like what if say hypothetically uh you're a uh, ship in a bottle or you living in a ship in a bottle and you're picked up uh at this um uh, store and everything so um yeah i think i think that's a, a good thing for a lot of our our, our readers and, and students and guests to to um, uh, consider is finding that balance of like, what can I take from personal experience? And then what can I also like learn and, and expand on as I write, um, which makes it a ever evolving adventure, I think that is probably why you all do it, correct? <laughs>
Unless unless you do it for the pain. I know some people like I love the pain of writing. <laughs> but I don't think uh, I know any of those people. <laughs> there's some people who do it, but I I am not one of them either. But um well we are at nine o'clock. It has it has flown by. Uh it has been wonderful. And um I I, I think it's it's good time to wrap it up. Um H Derek, personally, I'm I'm glad to see that you are back. No worries. Uh it was uh wonderful to hear your responses as well. Um and again to all of our guests and everything, um uh thank you for uh, attending. Um this was the Penman Review Fall Fiction Contest. And again, just congratulations to the winners, uh Kevin Broccoli. Uh, H. Derek Persley, Michael Cabrera, uh, Tim Brumbaugh, and Douglas Goff for sharing their work with us tonight. Um, for more about their winning pieces, as well as access to uh, a plethora of um, readings and other writing-related articles, uh, please make sure you do visit thepenmanreview.com. I put the uh, link in the chat there for all to review. Um, we're so glad that all of you were able to join us this evening. Thank you to all of our readers and guests. Um, keep an eye out for news on our next Word for Word event, which uh, should be scheduled in February. So uh, again, thank you and, and have a good night, everyone. Thank you for Thanks having so me. much to our readers thank and audience. Yes, thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Take care, all. <laughs>